This is episode 238 of the Andrew Hines Real Estate Investing Podcast. This episode is brought to you by Control and Compound Financial. They teach real estate investors how to multiply their wealth using infinite banking strategies. For a complimentary wealth coaching session or to learn more, visit www.controlandcompound.com forward slash Andrew Hines. Welcome back to the show. Today, I've got Pete Reese on and Pete is in San Diego, California, but he invests across the US doing land flipping, which is something I've heard of, never really dug into. Well, it was an incredibly interesting episode pete is doing uh well he's on track to do he thinks somewhere between five and ten million dollars in total sales this year within a 30 to 40 percent profit range uh, he said his average deal flip is uh, about twenty three thousand dollars in profit and uh, he's spending somewhere around uh three thousand to thirty five hundred dollars a deal in total marketing cost to find a deal. So Pete's running a fairly large organization to flip land, doing high volume and consistently growing his business, which he's been growing since 2020. Uh, In this episode, he did not hold anything back uh, from what I could tell. He shared absolutely every detail I asked him. He shared profit numbers, uh, every, you know, every detail I could think of to ask him, he shared it with me and uh, didn't have any reservations about doing so. I've had guests on in the past. I was, uh, you know, afraid to ask a certain question too, because I got a vibe that they didn't really want to go there. I didn't get that vibe here. And uh, it was really refreshing. It was great to hear, um, you know, the full scoop. Um, on on what he's doing. Um, Usually when somebody's willing to share this much, they're either selling a coaching program um, or they're selling something. Uh, He wasn't selling anything. Uh, (laughs) One thing he is doing is he is, um, he's basically asking people to send him deals and he'll partner with them on those deals, which I also thought was brilliant and uh, a real win-win. I really liked his approach with it. And uh, I think you're gonna enjoy it too. Um, I do want to remind people who are uh, watching this show, if you're, you know, if you're still focused on investing in Canada, you still want to make it work here. Uh, I do have a weekly show on YouTube called REI Hot Seat, where most of the episodes were going over deals that you either could do or real live active deals or off market deals that are uh, available or occasionally an example of a deal that's been done. Uh, And that's got a Canada focus to it. So maybe only once or twice have I done episodes that are outside of Canada uh, for REI Hot Seat. So if you're interested in kind of digging into the nitty gritty numbers, um, how how deals are working right now in Canada, uh, I'd highly recommend you check out REI Hot Seat. Uh, You will get the the blunt truth from me on many of the episodes, just kind of sharing my thoughts. I I think it is harder to do business in Canada, but it is still possible. And um, there are still deals that come, come around. Uh, but it's about being realistic, in my opinion, about what may work, what could work, what is likely to work, and uh, and then also making decisions about what's the path of least resistance in my business. So these things are big with me. I just thought I'd share that with you. Uh, if you enjoy that show, please make sure you, you support it. And uh, please do all the things for this podcast that will help it get more reach. Uh, that's how I grow, by you sharing it, by you liking, uh, commenting, reviewing. Uh, five stars is greatly appreciated if you haven't already done that. And without further ado, let's jump into the episode with Pete Reese. Please enjoy. Welcome to the Andrew Hines Real Estate Investing Podcast. Today, I've got Peter Reese on the show here uh, virtually, which I don't often do. But uh, Peter, I I don't actually remember when this request came, uh, but I must have been impressed and really wanted to have you on the show because we don't normally do the virtual. So thanks for doing this. (laughs) Well, thanks for having me for sure. And you can call me Pete. Uh, okay. my mom calls me Peter, but you know, it's normally when I'm in trouble. So yeah. yeah. Okay. Sounds good. <laughs> All right, Pete. Well, if you don't mind, uh, well, let's start with, uh, where are you physically located right now? Yeah, I'm in San Diego, San Diego, California. So it's, uh, you know, it's a big County, San Diego, California. So if you've ever been here, there's a place called Del Mar, which is a town North of the city. So yeah, yeah pretty, pretty nice weather all year round. Can't complain too much about that. Yeah, I've been down there one time. I, I uh, enjoyed that trip. My wife and I did uh, San Francisco all the way down to, uh, well, actually, I think we stopped at LA, if I'm not mistaken. We wanted to come down to San Diego. Ah. Uh, but I did go yeah, on a different that's, that's trip to San drive. Diego. Yeah, it's 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 such a nice uh, place. So um, yeah. anyways, yeah, I don't have a lot of ca- real estate investors in uh, in California. So tell me a little bit about the backstory. 
Yeah, you know, I'm from Pennsylvania originally, so I'm from kind of the whole other end of uh, of the U.S. But you know, I grew up there and went to college there. After college, I just you know I decided there's a lot more opportunity in California, and I didn't really like the weather over there, so I figured I'm just going to move out this way. Moved out with a friend of mine. Uh, one thing led to another. Met my wife um, when we got married we bought a home like a lot of a lot of people and uh it just sort of worked out that we the home needed a lot of work we put some work into it made some money on it a little bit of money made fifty thousand dollars which is pretty good at the time so I, I figured i was a i thought i was a real estate mogul and that, that kind of transitioned into us actually buying a bigger house that needed more work and then then we started getting into flipping homes and all this stuff so our, the journey into real estate was uh, was interesting because it just started with our home, and then we kind of realized we can do more, and it was a great vehicle to make money. And uh, real estate market crashed in about 2008 around here. Uh, luckily, before that, I'd gotten my broker's license in, in, here in California, and I just did it to get better access to the deals because I was able to show myself the homes on the market. I was able to put in offers myself. So just to reduce the friction is the reason I did it. But after the market crash, it came in handy because there were so many bank owned properties that were selling that that's all that was selling pretty much. And I just kind of focused on listing those properties for the bank. So that was a few years of my life, basically being an REO listing broker, they call it around here. So that was a, a weird time and yeah. a time that I don't want to revisit, but I was thankful to actually be doing business in real estate at the time when a lot of other people were struggling. So you'd done some flips and uh, done them profitably, but did you get caught on any flips when the uh, when the crash happened? Yeah, yeah, we were holding a couple homes. Uh, I mean, it wasn't anything um, uh, catastrophic or anything, but you know, it took forever to sell the properties, and we had to basically take a loss on a couple of them and stuff. But uh, it could it could have been worse. <laughs> so, uh, but it really scared us off from investing uh, at the time because I was young, and I didn't really understand that. You know those crashes like that. That's that's when you really build the long term wealth. That's when you really double down and you, you go for it. But I did the opposite thing, which wasn't very smart, and I just completely shied away from buying anything else ourselves. You know, we were we were buying when when everyone else was buying, and then at the the time when we uh, kind of shut down and didn't buy any other investment properties, that's when we should have been you know backing yeah. up the truck and, and loading up on inventory. You know. Yeah. Tur turning it on. Um, and I actually, I know a yeah. guy, uh, he's from near Toronto, uh, where I am right now. And he moved down to Florida when the crash happened and started investing in Southwest Florida, picking up properties for 10 cents on the dollar. And he was a financial planner, had never right. invested in real estate, but he just saw the opportunity down there. And he's like, well, I'd always been told, you know, buy low, sell high. He's like, how can you really lose when it's at one tenth the price? And, uh, yep. man, he figured something out that I didn't, I was just graduating university at that time. So my head just wasn't there. I wish it had been though, because, um, you know, he, he very quickly turned it into, a an opportunity that just replaced, you know, he didn't need to work again a day in his life. Um, like yeah. <laughs> the wealth he's amassed from that. He's, you know, he's good. So, um, hindsight's always <laughs> 2020. <sure>. Yeah. <laughs> so what yeah. have you done since? Yeah, so uh, I transitioned into at at that point after doing the bank owned properties, I kind of just used my license to kind of do real estate for other people. Like I, I represent clients, you know, as for short, for a while there, short sales were really hot, so I kind of focused on that, helping people with short sales. Um, and then I got into luxury homes for a little while, and then, but a big part of that was I made so many great contacts with larger investment companies. You know, when I was listing the the bank owned properties. So for a number of years there, I was just finding them deals. You know, mm -hmm. I, I knew what they looked for. I knew what they wanted to see. And I had great access to different deals. And I would find them as many, you know, as many deals as I could find, they would buy them. So mm -hmm. that was really easy for me. Uh, and I was kind of in that investment world, but I wasn't really doing it myself. Uh, got out of real estate kind of altogether, did a business with my wife for a uh, number of years, which was, uh, was pretty successful. We, um, she's been a blogger for a long time, travel blogging and, and lifestyle type blogging. And uh, she had lots of people approaching her about asking how to do that themselves. So we created a whole education business around that. We had like 5,000 plus students and 
all this stuff. And it was a great time, but I really had the itch to get back into real estate. That's my real passion. I knew I wanted to get back on the investment side, not as working as a broker or agent. So uh, I just started researching different models and I didn't really want to get back into flipping homes because I know I knew what went into that and I knew all the logistics and all the issues with that. So I was just looking for other models, the ways that people were making money, stumbled into some stuff, people talking about land flipping. Mm. And that really caught my attention because it was just at the time, it was just kind of anecdotes I was reading like, hey, I bought this property for 10,000 and I sold for 30,000 or you know, so, and I sold it in 60 days, you know, that kind of stuff. And it really intrigued me. And I thought, well, okay, that sounds pretty cool. I can, you know, triple my money and do it quickly and all this kind of stuff. So I ended up buying a training program from a course from uh, a provider out there and learned everything I could about the business model. And then I just dove, you know, head first into the, into the deep end. I started sending out a bunch of mail, which is how we generate our leads in this business, direct mail. And, uh, yeah, just started working. You know, I, I did the first year, um, end of 2020 when I bought this course on it, uh, learned how to do it, send out my first batch of mail on December, 2020, 20, March of 2021 is when we resold our first flip. So that first year, 2021, which was a partial year, I guess you could say it would ended up being about 1.2 and some change in revenue. And, mm -hmm. and almost 50% gross profit margin. Uh, 2022 ended up doing uh, about 3.5. And gross profit margin was a little lower, probably closer to 40%. And then 2023, 20, uh, I, I want to do 10 million this year, but we're already past what we did all of them in, in 2022. So, mm -hmm. um, you think yeah, you'll do so. 10 or you don't think you'll get that high? I, I think there's a good chance. I think there's a chance. Yeah. We'll see. If, okay, if not, so we'll come pretty close. So let's break down the concept. So you're you're basically just buying people who are who are basically land banking. You're just buying land from them, like it's not listed. You're just sending out mailers. Yeah, we're just sending out people or mail to people that own property. So we look up, you know, there's all kinds of databases here in the U.S. like where you can just look up, uh, you know, a particular county and in, in a particular state and pull up all the landowners get their mailing addresses mm -hmm. and uh you know you you filter it by you know acreage range or you know whatever criteria that one want to use mm. we send them out an offer uh, an actual offer in the mail based off of averages for that particular area mm -hmm. so if if an acre goes you know an acre is going for five thousand dollars an acre retail we might offer them two thousand an acre something like that and then you know we're cash buyer quick close so that's our our value proposition to them and you know some respond and are interested some respond and you know tell us you know to leave them alone some <laughs> some respond and say oh you're too low you know here's what it would take yeah. to put it together so basically then when they respond we try to put together a deal if it makes sense see if it's a quality property or not and then we go through the process and actually purchase it so yeah. if they if they sign it it's a conditional offer though is it conditional uh, on we your don't sign, We don't sign the offer when we send it out. So it's basically an offer to them. They would sign it first, then we look at it, and then we sign it if you know if we think it's a good deal. We want to. Oh, okay. So you send it. them the whole offer, filled out their pro their information on it, and then they just yes, exactly sign it if they like, uh, and then it would be irrevocable to you to to have the option to sign it as as well. Exactly. Yep. Yeah, that's a nice way of doing it. I, I know a friend of mine, he'll send out a signed offer uh, in the mail to somebody like they didn't even ask, you know, yeah. what's, what's your what's your email address? I have an offer for you. What are you talking about? My property is not for sale. What's your email address? Do you want to see it or not? <laughs> and he'll send it. That's to good. Guy. He's got properties that way. Um, you know, yeah, it, you know, it's a numbers game. Uh, I think if you don't put it on paper, like people just don't take it as seriously, whereas somebody who actually will send over a signed offer with, uh, you know, deposit attached, you know, I think that that just goes a long way in the minds of people get a deal. Yeah, done. for sure. You know, for us, it's a huge numbers game. So there's no way we can check out any of these properties. No, no, I get time you. Before we actually yeah. send out the mail, but I, you know, that's kind of like the, the sniper approach, you know, I could really see that working if you're interested in definitely particular properties and, yeah. or, you know, you just don't have as big of a budget to send out mass mail, yeah. but if you really work the defined list yeah. pretty hard, uh, I would see that. I would think that would work.
so how many um how many transactions are you doing in a year to get to this like you know say whatever wherever you land this year six seven million eight million mm -hmm. um we're so far we've done uh 55 deals this year 55 resales okay. this this so year 55 so, buy and then sold uh yeah we bought more than 55 probably close to 70 we bought but 50 55 we sold so far we've sold year. 55 this year okay so yeah, basically yeah. yeah you're doing a couple of deals a week then yeah yeah we're trying to you know we're trying to ramp that number up um been trying to work on expanding my team expanding everything basically yeah uh, the outreach the yeah trying to refine all our systems so. okay tell me about what uh you know what the process looks like and well i guess in, in terms of a cost like where are you targeting uh, what price points are okay? I mean, I, you mentioned a per acre, but is there a per property amount that you'll you'll consider as well? Yeah. So what we look for is um, mostly mostly what I do, and there's different investors that have their spin on land flipping. But what we do is we look for mostly rural properties. So when I when I when I say that, that I'm like five to ten acres minimum generally, okay. and up. So larger properties outside of a city or suburban area most of the time but you know they may be an hour to two drive uh, to a major metropolitan area um, yeah. so that's kind of the general criteria as far as the purchase price goes most of the stuff we buy ends up being in the range of twenty thousand purchase price maybe up to a hundred thousand we buy stuff larger than that as well but those are kind of outliers lower than that we we haven't been doing a lot of those this year just because you know, there's profit to be made on those, and, and there's like as far as an ROI type type thing. Like, mm -hmm. you can buy properties for like five or six thousand and sell them for twenty thousand. Obviously, triple, quadruple your money, something like that. Yeah. But it's as far as an absolute profit amount, it's just not not as not as um, worth the time for us, I guess you could say. But what if, um, like, say you're doing a deal? So if you're buying for twenty thousand, that means you think it's worth what thirty five, forty. If you're paying twenty thousand yeah, for something, yeah, yeah, we always try to do a double. So okay. if I'm buying it for twenty, that's kind of my general rule of thumb. Now I, I deviate from that based off of the property and how fast I think we could sell it, things like that. But like if I buy a property for twenty thousand, I'm trying to get forty thousand out of it. Yeah, and is that forty thousand assuming that like you're going to list it and sell it and get a contract at forty, or you're going to you're going to have a net after paying the realtor of forty? Yeah, so most of the time we end up netting less than that double. So I would do it, you know, if it's um I prefer to be able to list a little bit higher so we end up at that 40, but most of the time or a yeah. lot of the times it doesn't end up being that reality. So that's kind of the buy line. Like if I could buy for 20 and then I think that the ultimate contract price is going to be 40,000, I would do it. And we've obviously got transaction fees and and commissions on yeah, most, you have flat uh, on the resale side, flat so. transaction fees, and then you have uh, on the seller side, you're the seller agent, and then you just have the buyer agent uh, to pay. Well, we uh, we always use a local broker agent to to list the properties for us. So oh, okay, so you don't, don't do you don't practice that, yeah. as a as a realtor anymore. No, no. no. Okay, so we always so, we always farm that out. What do you got to pay on something? Because these are smaller price points, right? So, I mean, yeah. on on bigger stuff, you know, it's like what five to six percent total commission. Are you that that price point on these as well? Uh, was, we do on all the smaller stuff. We do ten percent total commission. Mm -hmm. So, um, if it's a forty thousand, you know, it's going to be four grand total. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and, you know, and our thing is that we want to we want to kind of establish roots in certain areas. So when we find a good broker or agent to work with, we try to do more and more deals with them yeah. to kind of really establish ourselves in that area. So I'm always of the belief that I want to pay people. So it makes sense. Like I, I want them working for us and I right. don't want it to be, uh, I want to be a good, uh, their best client basically. Hi friends. I just wanted to take a moment away from the episode to tell you about my brand new structured coaching program. This is the first time I've ever offered a structured coaching program where we'll have regular meetings in addition to an intro call uh, to go through what your goals are and help you get on a plan to achieve those goals within real estate. So if you have followed me for some time and you feel that I would be a fit for you to help you achieve your goals in real estate based on my skill set, based on the topics we cover on this show, 
I encourage you to head over to my website, andrew-hines.com forward slash coaching and fill out the questionnaire so that we can schedule a call and figure out if it's a fit for us to work together. Let's face it, most people could benefit from a second set of eyes and ears going over their strategies, different deals that they're looking at, and helping to springboard ideas back and forth. This is a program that's exactly for that. So if you're looking to build confidence in what you're doing in real estate investing and get very clear on what it is you're trying to accomplish, this might just be the program for you. Take a moment, fill out that questionnaire, and let's schedule a chat. So, so I, I well, right, you want to get their attention. The higher, yeah. Mm -hmm. no. Well, why are they going to do the business? Like, I mean, even at ten percent, that's potentially two grand to them, and then plus the transaction fee, right? Yes. Yeah. So yeah, yeah. So they're not they're not getting rich, but but hopefully we'll do yeah. a lot of deals with them, and it'll be yeah. worthwhile. And hopefully they'll find buyers, they'll get listings. Yeah, yeah. Oh, well, that's that. that's very invaluable. Like you know, they're just the buyer calls that they get. Um, yeah, there's obviously a value proposition to them at two grand. They're yeah. they're gonna be it's gonna be worth their while to list it. Hopefully, mm -hmm. or at least you'll find a, at least some good ones that will be uh, willing to do yeah. so. Uh, so that makes sense. But you've also got some closing costs to pay, like a state tax uh, to pay. Like, what do your closing costs look like? So say you, you sell it for 40, um, after you pay the title agent and get everything, like, what are you, what are you taking out of that deal? Um, yeah. So on the sell side, you know, we've got the 10% commission off the top and this, which is, you know, four grand. And then we are probably looking at about, a, you know, depending on the area, cause each, each area is different. They've got their different taxes. They've got different costs and everything like that. But I would say as a general on the sell, like resale side, we're probably looking at about a thousand. That's kind of generally what I estimate on the buy side. It's generally 1500 to 2000 in order to close that, that mm -hmm. purchase, uh, just, okay. just costs more. Yeah. So it's so. A, di a bit different there. I do some stuff in Florida and I I'm paying way mm -hmm. more on the sell side than on the buy side. Mm -hmm. uh, but I guess yeah. that comes down to what you put in your contracts too. And you know, what's yeah. kind of the, the normal practice there. Okay. So yeah. you're only a thousand bucks with your state tax and, and then your brokerage fees and all that, like the flat brokerage fees that go on top of the percentages. Uh, yeah. Well, so like the 4,000, like uh, for a commission, like a $40,000 property, yeah. 4,000 4, commission commissions. is the biggest chunk. And, yeah. and then and like, uh, all the escrow, um, uh, escrow or attorney title fees, depending on the state. Yeah. It's kind of like the thousand, you know, thousand. so it'd be like, five grand total with, with all that stuff. Yeah. So, so, so you know, 35 grand going to your account. 35. Yeah. 35 yes, goes exactly. to your account. Okay. Yeah. Good, good, good perspective. Yeah. I wouldn't have expected that in California. I would have thought it would have been more, but uh, I guess it's, well, we're, we're buying, we don't really buy too much in California. We're buying all over the country. So, ah, okay. Um, great. Yeah. I was gonna, I, yeah. I was gonna ask you if you buy in Cape Coral at all, because that's just lots everywhere. Um, oh yeah, yeah. There and, are lots uh, everywhere. They're all, all in that price point too. Yeah. You know, you can you can get a lot. Yeah, yeah. I, you're not going to find them listed at twenty grand anymore, but you know, you can find stuff. Yeah, you know, less than forty. Um, yeah. Okay, so yeah, we do some stuff in Florida, but mostly the rural stuff. You know, like the bigger. Properties. Oh yeah, that's right. That's not rural. So. Yeah. Um, okay, but I mean, on the topic of rural, rural properties, I would think generally have a slower absorption, a uh, slower transaction rate than city properties there's way more buyers for city properties so how does that factor into a fast turnover strategy yep well our whole thing is we buy an aggressive price so then we can resell at a really good price as well so we can force a quick sale so mm -hmm. uh, as a whole you know over this whole time when i've been doing land flipping we've been under 90 days like full hold time on these properties so this year has, has been has ticked up a little bit it's um i think year to date now we're at 99 days hold time on the properties that we've resold um last year and the year before that it was i think last year ended up being 66 days for the whole year on average mm -hmm. and before that it was uh, just about 60 days so it's yeah. uh you know we, we we buy we buy cheap so then we can resell cheap that'll force that sale so yeah. And as far as like what you're doing, once you buy them, are you really just buying it and then sending it right over to your local realtor to, uh, to list it? A lot of times. Yeah. yeah. A lot of times. Now, sometimes we'll do some minor value add stuff, depending on the property. Sometimes it'd be as simple as clearing some brush on a property so people could access it. You know, some of these properties have been, mm -hmm. no one stepped on them for 20 years. So 
except for the animals. So, yeah, yeah. you know, we we'll might clear some paths so people can actually walk through the, the, the mm-hmm. thick underbrush to access the property. We'll do stuff like sometimes we'll do a perk test on the property, which means basically it uh, it's suitable for a septic system and buildable in, in a lot of these areas. So we'll do some yeah. stuff like that. And then sometimes we'll do some minor subdivisions, which in some of these areas means that we split it up into five lots or less and then resell each lot individually you know if it's like a larger parcel 100 acres or something we might split it up into five 20 acre parcels or something like that and that's how easy process in some of these areas yeah i was just gonna ask you how quickly can you do that because you can't you can't do that that quickly here uh where i'm i'm from yeah california you can't either it's a crazy process but in some of these states it's a matter of hiring a surveyor they go out and they map it all out and then they file it with the county Mm -hmm. and it's done so it's as quick so as they you just, get the survey They done, fill right? it all out and they put a proposition. Or this could be, you know, five lots laid out this way, and then and then the county just says, okay, that fits the zoning. Yeah, the yeah zoning pretty much. They, draw, they draw up the map. Um, you know, in the county, they they have these cri- this criteria set. They might say something like, in order to do a minor subdivision, which is this process, it has to be at least ten acres, and it has to have road frontage. You know, they might have some some qualifications mm. like that. But as long as it fits that criteria that they set out, yeah. then it's a it's a pretty easy process. Nice. This sounds like a pretty um, a pretty interesting model. Not one that not one that I've heard uh, anyone really talk about. Um, but I, that's the thing I love about the U.S. in general is just like there's so many different people doing different strategies and, and winning with them. There's just so many different ways you can approach it. A lot of that is is based on the availability of information, right? Uh, like what what All softwares are you using? What softwares are you using to uh, to cr- like filter out the properties? Like, is it PropStream or is there something else? Yeah, PropStream. We use PropStream for some lists. I, I use DataTree, which is another provider as well for some lists. And uh, yeah, so th- it's DataTree is a first American company, a title company, but but they, um, you know, there's there's a number of different list providers, and everyone kind of swears by their own, but they all do pretty much do the same thing. In the U.S., it's very uh, the information is out there because all these counties, it's public records of who actually owns these parcels. So it makes the whole business doable. Plus, we have some other tools that we use as well, which allow us to kind of evaluate all these properties. Pretty much 90% of what a property is, we can tell just by looking it up. There's one in particular that we use like every day. It's called Land ID. It used to mm-hmm. be called MapRite. But anyhow, yeah, we just look it up on there. We can see everything, you know, all kinds of different satellite images, overlays for wetlands, for the flood zone yeah. areas. You know, we can see the road frontage, contour, you know, all this different yeah. stuff that we look at. And uh, it, you know, before those tools were available like that, it just wouldn't have really been a doable business. <laughs> it would have been yeah. a lot more difficult. It would have had to have been local. You'd have to go look at the property yourself. You know? But your competitors have these tools too, right? Like it's it's a double edged sword mm-hmm. when you have yeah. these tools. It, it it lowers the barrier to entry. Uh, for people to get in. So do you find that you're just niche enough that not enough people are really competing directly with what you're doing because you're doing the rural land and land to begin with, right? Like not everyone's looking at land. They're looking at houses and and trying to look up stuff that way too. Yeah. So my my thing is, I, you know, in any niche, pretty much there's always going to be competition. There's other land investors out there and other people doing it. It's way less saturated than the fix and flip uh, type model that, that most uh, uh, most investors do as for as far as a short-term strategy goes so that's that's pretty saturated in my opinion but but even though it's really saturated there's people that are just crushing it in that fix and flip space you know for houses mm-hmm. and there's people that are absolutely crushing it in the land flipping business as well so there are um you know especially when you get into the hotter areas the areas where there's a lot of activity and just just a lot of things going on you're going to run into some competition sometimes sometimes mm-hmm. you send out letters to people and they're like oh i got a letter from another investor and yeah. you know <laughs> th- that kind of stuff and that happens but it's just all a numbers game you know and we're always yeah. monitoring kind of our return on on investment with our with our outreach and mm-hmm. if it ever got to the point where the numbers didn't make sense then then i guess we'd have to yeah, you reevaluate. Yeah. yeah. Do you find that the, the cost has stayed consistent or has it gone up over the last three years? Like the cost per acquisition, like in terms of marketing. Spend? Yeah, it's it's gone up slightly for me. Um, but I mean, when I say slightly, I mean, like it was at about three thousand per deal very consistently, like three thousand dollars in mail costs for every deal that we get. 
Uh, mm -hmm. It's probably closer to 3,500 right now, but mm -hmm. I've also changed some other variables. I've only focused on larger properties lately, and I'm pickier than I used to be as well, you know, just based off of experience and, yeah. you know, realizing what are good properties and what are not so good properties. So, um, yeah, so, so not a not a terrible change in cost so you're so if your average yeah. deal like what what's your average sale price on a deal yeah well so our average profit per deal is twenty three thousand. Twenty three thousand. So okay it's uh yeah. yeah that's the that's the big metric that we track and that's you know that's average because some properties we do really well i make you know close to a hundred thousand on them or something and then some properties mm -hmm. i you know i've had a couple where i i haven't lost money on any deal yet knock on wood but I yeah. have had a couple where I made like 500 bucks or thousand dollars or something like that, which is, it's not a loss, but it's not, mm -hmm. not any giant win either. So that's the average of all those types of properties. What's like, do you have like a couple in your mind that stand out over your progression in the last few years that were just like, Oh, that was a dud. Like that, I shouldn't have done that deal. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. There was one that really bothered me. It was, it was a property that I think it was nine acre property. It was in Virginia. And it was in a decent area. It was actually kind of a beautiful area. Lots of nice trees, big farms, like kind of overlooking a horse farm and everything. It was nice. It was on a on a main road. But I made one giant mistake on it that I just didn't factor in as much. It was um, pretty slope property, but not terrible. It, it was a usable type slope yeah. property. But the road frontage, how you get onto the property, there was like this rock wall type cliff almost. And I don't know why I didn't put two and two together and think, huh, how's someone actually going to get onto this property? Like when you look in the maps and everything, it's like road front and just you look at yeah. it and you say, okay, well, there's easy access. Yeah. But then, you know, we had a lot of people go out there and they're like, how do I even get onto the property? I got to walk on a neighbor's property to even access this property yeah. or bring my climbing gear to get up this, <laughs> this sheer wall, which is probably 10 feet of rock or something, you know? And, uh, you know, so we eventually sold it, but it probably took me nine, ten months, something like that. And then we that's one of those deals where we made like five hundred bucks on it, you know, after all this time. Yeah. And if it wasn't for that issue, you know, we would have done well. We probably would have doubled our money on it, but um, <laughs> we haven't learned, I guess. Yeah. Were there like going into this, because you'd never really done anything like this from the sounds of it before you started doing it, yeah. what were your you know, what was in your mind? as you were getting out of that travel blog, you know, business, I guess you were kind of forced to get out of that since the lockdowns kind of killed all that. Yeah, that, yeah that's true. <laughs> There's a catalyst. Um, what was going through your yes. mind? Is it like, it's kind of do or die. I got to do something. So let's do this. Uh, no, no, it was more like, I, I honestly, I've always loved real estate. Even when I was like a teenager, I bought one of those infomercial things. I don't know if they had them in your area or not, but they had this guy on TV, Carlton Sheets, where he would he would sell this real estate investing program. Anyhow, I bought it when I was a teenager. Just never took any action. So I've always been like really interested in real estate and and, and doing that. So doing the the business with my wife, the the blogging education business was great, and it was fun because we got to travel all over the world and do all kinds of cool stuff with it. But but I knew I had to get back to I knew I had to get back to my to real estate, and I really wanted to build. Um, you know, kind of a long-term investments and everything. And it really wasn't focused on that. We were focused on building our business, but no, you know, real estate assets. We, you know, we had our house and things, but we weren't really accumulating other types of uh, investment assets. So I, I kind of knew I had to get back into real estate and that was kind of, uh, I was like, okay, well, we can't really teach about travel blogging right now. So uh, this is a good time. <laughs> so, yeah. So that's that's so just, kind of what the catalyst was, and then this just happened to be the strategy that you know popped up for you, and you thought it made sense, so you pulled yeah. the trigger on it. Yeah, and it was easy to talk my wife into it too because you know they weren't huge numbers we were dealing with. You know, I yeah. was like, okay, we, we'll do, we'll just try a few. You know, we'll buy this mm -hmm. property for ten, fifteen thousand, and try to double our money on it. And she she bought into it. She believes in me, and it worked out well. But I'm glad that. You know, I didn't, you know, have a loss or something like that on my first deal because it could have completely changed the trajectory. Could have tanked it. You know, you know the interesting thing I find. Yeah, like, could have tanked it. Like you got out of the business for a while and you stayed out for a while, right? You were out of real estate for how yeah. long? Like as an investor? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, I guess the last uh, probably about twelve years. 
from buying wow. actively buying properties you know wow that's crazy yeah. that's a long time i mean for yeah. me like my family's like in it um all my not all my friends but like the new friends i had made were in it and uh, i had a similar thing that you know i lost some money on some stuff i had some hard times with it and i just got out for a couple of years two years uh not 12 but yeah like i just i yeah. i saw people just doing and winning and it's like I, I can't sit on the sidelines here i gotta i gotta jump back in yeah. and uh yeah I'm, I'm glad you did i mean it sounds to me and maybe like your previous business was also crushing it in a similar way but it sounds like you're exceptionally profitable uh in in sort of in a for a, what would be a life-changing way for a lot of people would you agree with that definitely definitely life-changing way i mean it's once you figure out the business, like once you figure out how to evaluate these properties and really understand what's a good deal, what's a not so good deal, uh, it's like a world of opportunity opens for you because there's very few people. There's not a lot of people around that that are looking at these properties in that way. And uh, it's you know I want to stop short of saying it's like a like a way to print money or anything like that, but it's a it's a really it's a really really powerful business model if you can. You know, it's just a numbers game and making those offers and sending out the mail and getting those leads and everything like that. But then you, when you can recognize what's a deal and what's not a deal, you feel confident in, in pulling the trigger on that and making that that deal happen. So uh, things start accelerating really quickly when you're able to double your money on deals in, you know, 60 to 90 days and keep that money just continually like snowballing. I mean, yeah, it, sounds it, it really gets it gets crazy. And then if you start yeah. multiplying out the return on investment and everything, nothing else yeah. really that I've ever seen that really comes close unless you're lucky yeah. and you hit it in crypto or something like that. I don't know. But this is real assets too. So it's not well, yeah, speculation. Exactly. You're holding on to something real. And I, I I would say like land would be something that would probably be tougher to sell in a hard recession because people aren't going to be interested in mm -hmm. going and building a house, right? Their their appetite for land is going to be lesser so than you than a house. Um have you given thought to that? Or I guess you'd have some some warning signs. Uh, I mean, obviously, the U.S. and Canada are both threatening recession. Um, you know, the, the pessimists in us are already, you know, saying it is, uh, all, even if it doesn't show. Uh, what are your thoughts on that? How will you pivot? Do you think it'll affect your business? Uh, what are your, what's your take? Yeah, so the, the good part about what we do in this model is that the short hold times. So if we get to the point where we're, recognizing that things are taking longer to sell, we're having issues, the economy is starting to mm -hmm. melt down or something like that, then we can pivot pretty quickly and uh, hold out for better buy prices. Uh, yeah. Even, you know, I, I think I always think back to this, like, first of all, these rural properties, most of the buyers are cash buyers on the other side, or they might be getting a HELOC or home equity line of credit or something like that against another asset that they've got. But mm -hmm. for the most part, these are you know, people in that local area, they're buying it for recreation, maybe a potential home site down the road. Uh, very few of them actually get land loans. But so I always think back to this when I was an REO listing broker for these banks, you know, in the worst real estate crash recession in, in recent history, that even at that time, I would list these properties for the banks and they would just they would price it at the current market value, not what it had sold for in the past. They, they would completely disregard that. When it, when it was in their inventory, they would give me an assignment to list these properties. They're like, what do you think it's worth in this market? So I'd give them my opinion. I'd list it on the market. And these properties, they'd have 30 offers, you know, mm -hmm. and they were cash buyer investors. Yeah. Uh, so it taught me that even in the worst of times, if you could price things properly, it's mm -hmm. going to sell. No, it's a good point. Um, that, that's that's what I keep in mind. Um, so you so don't ultimately you just you just pivot, right? Like you, you oh, we turn yeah, off the buying, you adjust, and uh, and then we'll yeah, price it. If you got to take a small loss on a few, I I mean, you're buying them aggressively, as you say. So if you have to take less profit, then then that's what you do, and you kind of just uh, you're you're making hay while the sun's shining, so to speak, and uh, I think that makes yeah. a lot of sense. So talk to me about yeah. the the funding model because to buy like at any one time would you say you own 50 properties uh yeah pretty i'm pretty close to that right now yeah all okay. all free and clear uh for the most part except for a couple uh a couple exceptions so but that, and, um and then you're yeah. looking at what like a fifty thousand average price something like that probably somewhere in that neighborhood yep so 
Um, you know, my, my inventory amount fluctuates, you know, like, mm -hmm. uh, and recently it's been kind of floating between two, three million worth of inventory, you know, basically what, mm -hmm. uh, conservatively, I think it could sell for something like yeah, that. Yeah. I just ran a quick but, number at two, 2.75 million. Um, yeah, there you go. There you go. So uh, 2.75 so of does, inventory, which needs to be funded. Um, are you raising this all? I mean, you're not taking any mortgages cause you're doing cash buying. Um, are you right. raising this from private investors or you guys just made a lot of money on your travel blogging and, and can float the whole thing? Uh, uh, well, we did a lot. We did really well with that that education business. Uh, you know, we had thousands uh, of, of premium students. So that 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 business made us like multi millions per year. Not okay. made us, but in revenue, we were doing multi millions per year. Gotcha. So that, that was a great business, and it gave us a good seed to start with. Uh, so we took a certain amount, dedicated to this business, and then, uh, like I said, it accelerates pretty quickly. You know, the first okay. year we did thirty two deals the whole year. Uh, the second year we did. 69 in the whole year and mm -hmm. like i said we're about 55 so far this year so it mm -hmm. starts to to really snowball so uh like i said we've got a couple of larger properties where i took on a partner and things like that but um but i don't um you know i'm not taking out loans on any of these properties generally i've no. got i've got a couple of people that uh i just started working with that um uh, they kind of do a sort of a hybrid model where they'll and for, for some experienced investors, they'll, they'll lend some private money on that. And then, you know, they, they you know, it costs for, it costs for the money, you know, obviously like a hard money loan on a home, but that market mm -hmm. is not developed in the land business. It's mostly like cash deals if you want to do it. Or yeah, land isn't popular, especially so, with these price points. Lenders don't like it. They yeah. don't like lending on that stuff. Yeah. yeah. So cash, cash is king, especially with land buying. Um, right. You could always uh, talk to sellers about a, a vendor take back. Do you ever do that? Um, you know, I, I really haven't, you know, and I probably should be, you know, I've, I've been thinking about that a lot lately, like some of these deals that we walk on because the numbers aren't quite there, mm. but in those type of situations, I would probably still do the deal if they held back the financing mm. and, you know, and less, less money out of pocket for us and still being able to make a profit without having to commit such a large amount yeah. of cash. Well, that juice so. is your return too, right? If you figure if yep. they're doing a, if they do a 75% mortgage on it and you're only in for 25% of what you would have been in for, I, I'm sure you're going to be more than doubling your money. In yeah. most, you know, yeah, in most cases, sure. if you're picking a good deal, uh, on that note, how many, how many deals do you, uh, need to look at? Like, say you get sellers, you know, contact you back and say, yeah, we're interested. How many do you look at to, to actually secure a deal? I'd say, just as a rough guesstimate, I'd say it's about one in ten we actually move forward with. Mm, one in ten, yeah. and and the reasons the other ones don't work is what they're they're being too rigid on the price, or it, you know, does it always boil down to that? There is a number, but they just want too much for what it is. Price is a big part uh, part of it. So sometimes we just can't can't get together on price. The other thing that happens a lot is the property itself is just not a quality property. Could be on the side of a mountain, mm. could be landlocked, could be all wetlands. It could be something that's just just a really weird shape to the parcel or something like that. So yeah. I've really tried to stay away from those type of properties because they always take longer to sell and they always sell for less than what I project they're going to sell for. So problem properties yeah. are something I stay away from. Try to just get the quality ones and... Uh, focus our business around that. Everything goes a lot smoother that way. Okay. Um, how did those ones like that, for that example, the wetlands are on it. Um, how'd they even get on your list to mail out? Like, is your list not that discerning as far as like when you're mailing, it's just, it meets a certain criteria with land, like acreage. Uh, and that's about it. So you haven't, yep. you haven't reviewed them or there, you, there's no way you can screen that out on them. Like, Oh, wetlands, make sure don't, yeah. don't include those. Yeah, that's tough. You know, it's tough to screen out those properties because, you know, I could I could pay a VA or something like that to go through and look at all these properties and kind of take a lot of those off the list. And I've heard of other investors doing that, but we're sending out such a huge volume, yeah. you know, fifty to a hundred thousand letters a month at this point. Uh, it would really take forever to, to go through all those properties. No, I like what you're is, doing. I don't I blame like, you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know, and the other thing is too that a lot of these properties, we may look at the pro property that they respond about and it'll be a no-go for whatever reason, but we're always finding out about other properties they own as well. And a lot of these people own multiple properties. Yeah. So 
we've gotten a lot of good deals from just asking like, Hey, what else do you have? What else can we write an offer for you on? And we get, we yeah. get good deals that way. So even though the property is a no go at first, uh, we're always trying, you know? Oh, that's awesome. Um, I had, I had a question I was going to ask you and it's escaping me. What have I, uh, <laughs> what have I missed? Um, you know, in terms of what you usually get asked. Yeah. Well, you know, um, I, I get asked like, how hard is it to kind of get up and going this business and, and, and related to that, you know, if, if you were to start in this business, like how long does it take to actually start receive you know, receiving money, like a paycheck or whatever from, from this, uh, like a check from, from this type of thing. And, uh, you know, generally it's, a, it's a how, about how much you want to commit to the education side of things, like yeah. really evaluating properties and, you know, how, you know, when I, when I get into something new I, and maybe this is just my personality type, like I go all in, I'm like super focused. I can't really think about other things until I really figure it out. So that's the way I am. And I don't know, I know that other people are, some people are probably not that way. They just kind of chip away at things a couple hours at a time here or there. Yeah. Uh, so it can be done pretty quickly. And also I had a big head start because I knew real estate and I didn't know land at all, but yeah. I, I knew how to do transactions. I knew how to do real estate and look at investment properties um, for, you know, I had, so I had that base going um, as far as like from, sending out your first batch of mail to doing your first deal and actually getting a check back, you know, 90 to 120 days is, is what it probably is on average. If you're, you know, yeah, if, you're, if you're really working it, if you're buying a good price, you're, you're trying to get somebody who's going to write an offer and close in 30 days, something like that. So you yeah. list it after yeah. 20, 30 days, somebody writes you an offer closes in 30 days. And then that, yeah. that, make, that brings you to 60 days. Okay. Oh, yeah. and anywhere in between up to 90 well plus when you write an offer you got to wait to close too right what's the, the quickest you're going to close yeah. two weeks yeah well 30 days it, i mean quickest a few weeks but 30 days most of them being uh, on average when we're yeah. you know after we get it under contract it takes we have a whole due diligence process that we yeah. go through but yeah you know it just takes time these title companies you know yeah. Um, what's your team look like VA wise or physical employees, uh, to pull this off hundred thousand mail outs a, a month? Yeah. Yeah. Well, we've been expanding our team quite a bit over, uh, over the past, well, past year, uh, specifically really we've been trying to ramp up my team because I'm trying to get myself out of a lot of the day-to-day -day stuff. A lot of the day-to-day -day roles and more of just kind of the big picture steering of the ship is kind of what I want to do. But so I've got, uh, I think I get nine people kind of working in all different aspects of it. I've got um, a uh, acquisition. I've got two acquisition managers. Actually, their job is to actually be on the phones and texting and emails and everything and, and responding to all the sellers that contact us. I've got someone that inputs all the leads into the CRM from, from various sources, wherever they come in, whether it's sending us a letter in the mail, calling into our call center that we, we outsource, or you know, emailing us, texting us, that type of thing. So they put compile everything, put it in our CRM the way yeah. we want to see it. Um, I've got a kind of a head of acquisitions that kind of oversees that process, kind of makes decisions on, you know, should we move forward on this property? Should we just, should we not, you know, consider this as a potential property, things like that. Mm -hmm. They also do some review of the due diligence. I've got, uh, I've got another team member that's now, he just started, he's kind of working on the due diligence side of things. Uh, we used to outsource that to a company kind of doing all those, uh, these due diligence reports, but he's going to be doing a lot of that for us directly. Okay. Got someone else that's like calling for photographers and getting all that lined up. And then I've got a transaction manager. She kind of deals with all the, the paperwork and dealing with the title companies and all yeah. that kind of stuff. And then I, I just also recently hired a COO that's going to kind of uh, run all the operations of our whole team. So. Um, that's, a that's, a big, <laughs> that's a big operation you built pretty darn quickly. Um, yeah. I'm trying to build it for where we're going, not where we're at right now. So I understand yeah. people will probably look at it and say, oh, that's kind of overkill for what you're doing. But yeah, um, I'm tr trying to project to the future. How many of these employees are, are uh, physically present at your location versus virtual? Yeah. Um, we're not, we're all remote. Every all single remote team member's okay. remote. So. Yeah, so yeah. we've got, uh, let's see, we've got one, two, three, four, five, five team members in the U.S. Got mm -hmm. another one in, splits his time between Italy and Greece. 
uh, but he's he's from New Jersey. Um, and then I've got uh, uh, some other um, team members from Philippines and also Pakistan as well. Okay. Wow, that's uh, that's impressive. It's a big team. It's a lot to manage. Um, and I'm yeah. guessing when you started yeah. this, like when you started the first month you were doing this, uh, how many people was it? Was it just you? It was me. It was me. You, I was doing everything. You were stuffing the envelopes, <laughs> then, or you had somebody doing that? No. <laughs> Thankfully, I wasn't doing that. I've I've always hired a uh, mailing company uh, from the beginning. So we, basically, we send them the list, and then they yeah. just take care of all the mail. So here's the but, list. Here's the letter. That, or do you, do you do the mail merge and send them the file? Um, actually, they do the mail merge and everything. So we establish a letter with all the mail merge fields, and we yeah. have a corresponding google sheet that goes along with that yeah. and they merge it all together and make it happen so um oh, that's awesome but yeah pretty quickly i brought on a, a, a an assistant that was working with me on our other business and i had him kind of doing some of the administrative type tasks and things that i didn't want to do anymore yeah. and i taught him how to do those things and that's kind of how it grew i just like taught yeah brought on new team members taught him how to do certain things i didn't want to do it anymore so yeah well, I can imagine early on your phone must have just got blown up. Like that must have been, you know, and having sent out flyers myself, like I know what it's like when your phone blows up way more than you have the ability to take the calls. Um, so how yeah. did you how did you handle that? That must have been stressful because I know the feeling. Yeah, well, I've, I've had a call center from the beginning. So like 24 oh, really? hour uh, call center, they answer all the inbound calls. They send an email, you know, with the lead information. And at the beginning there, there, there wasn't, <laughs> it was tough for me to juggle everything and respond to all those people. So what I was doing was kind of a shortcut. I was just looking up properties, the ones that looked like they were interested, I would call them back. Um, the ones that didn't look like good properties, they kind of went to the wayside, you know, not the right way to deal with yeah. it, but that's what I was doing at the time to kind of keep my head above water. So. Yeah. Like, so even that, even with you not taking the call, yes, yeah, that was definitely the mistake I made early on is just not having a proper, I had no idea when I sent out flyers for the first time, how many responses I would get <laughs> and uh, was not even close to prepared for it. So I felt like I just wasted a whole bunch <laughs> of money, which I, which I technically did. I did. I lost money on that mail out because I just, there was potentially like 50, 100, $200,000 in profit easily in that list. Uh, but I just couldn't uh, capitalize. But like you said, live and learn. I love that about the U.S. You can just get the call center to do it. Uh, you probably a Google search away to find a call center willing to uh, to take your calls and just charge you oh, a, yeah. a fee yeah. for it. Um, okay, so so tell me a little bit about like what it is you're you're doing on here because I I suspect you didn't just want to come on and share your story. Um, <laughs> do you do coaching on this stuff. Well, I don't have anything to, to sell, um, but I do. I did start um, a little bit earlier this year. I started a land investor community. It's called Land Conquest, landconquest.com. Anyhow, it's a, basically a place for people to, you know, new investors and also experienced investors to kind of share knowledge, share tips, learn how to do the business and everything. And, and as part of that, I dedicated a lot of time and a lot of money and resources to develop a, a whole training program on that that uh, teaches people from A to Z like how to flip land. Like we have our letter that we give out. We have, you know, everything. Everything you're going to need to know. Call center to, to hire, you know, all this these different steps of the process. So I teach people how to do that and in that training program and it's completely free. Um, how, why would I give it out for free? And, and, you know, people always say like, oh, there's a catch and it must be, you know, it must be crappy program or something. It's not, it's probably, uh, you know, I spent tens of thousands of dollars to actually put this program together and do it right. But, you know, I've got a number of ways that I, I will make money off of this. My number one thing is, uh, I have a program called partner with Pete, which is essentially it's a deal funding program. So, mm -hmm. I know uh, a big sticking point for a lot of investors is like, Hey, this sounds cool, but I don't, I don't have this money to in cash to like mm -hmm. put down for all these deals. So what we do is that they submit the deal. If it's a deal, then I'll fund the deal myself. Like I'll actually mm -hmm. um, send the money to close the deal and I'll have my team kind of take over and, and do all the steps in the process. We'll get it resold at the end of the day. Then we both split the profits 50, 50. So I think it's a win win and it's a great, um, it's a great way to really get up and going in this business. And you get to the point, then you want to start using your own money for the deals and then that's great. But, but until that point, it really solves, solves a need there. And, I, and I'll probably do a, 
kind of higher end uh, mentorship program as well at some point, but I'm, I'm, I'm not there yet. So very um, cool. Well, yeah, I appreciate uh, you coming on and sharing all this stuff. Like it's, it's great to hear a strategy that works. I mean, the one thing that, that I guess I would find a little bit uh, worrisome and maybe it's just me being skeptical or, or not skeptical, pessimistic uh, is why wouldn't everybody just run into this? And I know everybody has their own barriers and their own burdens and things they do in limited time. Yeah. Um, but as with so many things I've seen, um, when it seems very profitable, a lot of other people see that too. Do you see that future yep. of this changing or has it been relatively consistent? Uh, no, it's been accelerating the past year or so. More people mm -hmm. are getting into it, you know, as soon as they realize that home flipping and the wholesaling market that's that's tough, you know, for homes is tougher than they thought it would be. So we're getting a lot of people kind of going over into land flipping. It's a big awareness thing too. You know, land is not as exciting, you know, even no. myself, like I had never done anything with land. I didn't know the first thing about it. And I always kind of dismissed it because I thought land takes forever to sell. And, you know, it was one of these things where you have to hold these properties for 10 years to sell some of them. And it's just, a, you know, it's the complete opposite for my model. But um, yeah, so that's that's a thing. I think it's an awareness thing. And obviously, there's a lot of land investors. And that's kind of one of, well, another reason why I want to do the community so that people could see, you know, people beyond me that are actually doing it. I kind of, mm. I kind of lay it all out there. I'm way too, maybe not, I don't say it, I don't think I'm too open, but I'm very, very transparent about everything I do, my exact mm. numbers that I do every month, every single deal that I do. Like I have a I have a website, it's called turningprofit.com where I do a monthly income report. Mm -hmm. So I break down everything, the revenue, the profit for that month, every single deal that we resold that month, what we bought it for, what we sold it for, notes on that property, profit margin, like everything. I lay it all out there. Uh, so, you know, people can see what's possible and if it's something that they think could align well with their skill set. Um, so, you know, I'm just trying to I'm trying to get the the awareness out there so more people will know about it. And if it's if it's interesting, then hopefully we can do some business together and partner on some deals. Cause I know uh we've already had a, a bunch of students. Uh I think I've got 17 deals that I'm partnering on with with people just from our community that have submitted deals over the past month. So that's, really cool. that's uh that's a big area for expanding. And obviously we don't we won't make the full, you know, 100% of the profit. We'll just make 50% of the profit, but it's still definitely worth doing and still very profitable for us to do that. So, um, I don't know. I, I see it as a, I see it as a win-win and, you know, right now the business model definitely works and mm -hmm. I see it working qu for quite some time, but you never know what the future is yeah. going to bring, I guess. Yeah. It doesn't, it doesn't seem to me like something that would take a huge amount of, um, time to get set up started on anyway like you could be sending yeah. offers pretty darn quick you could be sending out mailings quickly, within yeah. within a couple of weeks you could be sending out probably within a week you could be sending yep. out some mailings yeah that's what uh, i did <laughs> yeah yeah so it's, it's something that you can be pulled the trigger on quick you got to have some money available to do it obviously um but yeah, yeah super super interesting i i like i think it satisfies the needs right like a need for you know that quicker income right because a lot of investors want to invest for the long term especially in my following uh, you know, in cash flow, and like a lot of it's just about amassing wealth. And a lot of people forget, myself included, like not focusing enough on the short term income, uh, which I think this is great for. It's a great way to to drive yeah. your business in the short run, too. And I'm big well, on multiple streams. The way I, yeah, I mean, the way I view it and the, the way that's been working for us is that we're this is short term active type income. Mm -hmm. And excess we put into the long term hold type property. So it works out pretty yeah. well. You get your immediate needs taken care of. Uh, yeah. And then you funnel as much yeah. as you can into the wealth building side. So. Uh, and 100%. I think people, I think people underserve their immediate needs. You know, they, they should do more. And then that way, when you have extra money from the immediate needs, you can put that money, like you said, into the longer term stuff. So, um, yeah, awesome. Really, uh, really great talking to you, Pete. If people want to learn more about you, where's the, uh, the best place for us to send them? Yeah, best place. Uh, first of all, landconquest.com. That's our land flipping community. Turningprofit.com is the website for our podcast, which is also called uh, Turning Profit, but that has the income reports on there. And then obviously you can find us on YouTube. It's just at Turning Profit. And then my Instagram is at Reese Peter, which is my last name and then my first name. So. Cool. All right. Really appreciate you taking the, the time to talk to me. And um, I'm glad we we did this. I'm looking forward to putting it out. Sounds good. I really appreciate it, Andrew.
There are a lot of people out there talking about the infinite banking strategy and whether or not it makes sense for them. To find out what it's all about and if it's a fit for you, visit controlandcompound.com forward slash Andrew Hines, where my audience can gain exclusive access to books, podcasts, and webinars tailor-made for real estate investors.